Hey everybody, welcome to session 150 of the Behavioral Observations podcast. Boy, do I have a great show in store for you. I finally got a chance to sit down with Dr. Vince Carbone, and we covered so many things in this particular episode. Uh, what we didn't cover, however, uh, were the ins and outs of verbal behavior. I know a lot of people expect that when you see the name Vince Carbone. Uh, he will be talking about those things at this year's 2021 Verbal Behavior Conference, which I'll get to in just a second. Um, but instead, we talked about stuff that, uh, I guess, his point of view on the field as a whole, we talked a lot about uh, where he came from as a behavior analyst, You know, some of his uh, humble beginnings, how he transitioned from an aspiring baseball player into a student of behavior analysis, some of his uh, early career experiences, what it was like to have B.F. Skinner sitting in your talk at a conference. Can you imagine that? Can you really imagine that? I can't. Uh, so, so many really cool uh, anecdotes and stories and whatnot. Uh, towards the end of the show, uh, Vince also shared his thoughts on the recent passing of Jack Michael and the impact that he had in the field. Um, we talk about so many other things as well, where he'd like to see the field uh, be in 20 years. Uh, I could go on and on. The, our conversation kind of went all over the place. Uh, this is a an interview that could have been easily two or three hours. Uh, we actually spent about another half hour or longer after we concluded the actual interview chatting. I, I wish I just rolled tape on the whole thing, to be honest with you. It was just a fascinating and fun conversation. And I'm excited to share it with you. So... Uh, as I alluded to earlier, Vince will be giving not one but two talks at the 2021 Verbal Behavior Conference. It takes place on April 22nd and 23rd, and it's brought to you by my friends at the Central Texas Autism Center. Uh, there will be many other great speakers there as well. And like last year, they invited me to facilitate the panel discussion. So if you'd like to learn how to get in on that, uh, go to uh, behaviorlive.com forward slash VBC for Verbal Behavior Conference. I'll also have the links in today's show notes as well. And if you do decide to register for the conference, use the code PODCAST10 to save 10% at checkout. Uh, before we get to the conversation, I do want to let you know that uh, this podcast is sponsored by The Essential for Living. It's the most comprehensive life skills curriculum and teaching handbook on the market today. You know, during the interview, uh, Vince gave uh, Pat uh, McGreevy, the developer of the EFL, a shout out. And I let Pat know about that. And he, he wanted to sponsor this episode. So uh, so here we are. Uh, so the EFL, it's designed for both children and adults with moderate to severe disabilities, including but not limited to autism. Uh, to learn more about the EFL, go to essentialforliving.com. It's not essentials. It's essentialforliving.com. And if you do decide to purchase any EFL materials, use the code BOEFL to save 10% off of your order. And that coupon code is good now through the end of March. And again, I'll have links to this in the show notes. We're also sponsored to, by HowToABA.com. Uh, we featured the folks from HowToABA.com in a recent episode. And uh, as you know, being a BCBA sometimes can be lonely and overwhelming. And at HowToABA.com, they help BCBAs feel supported and confident by providing easy-to-access printable CUs along with a collaborative community. So for more information, go to howtoaba.com and check out the Behavior Resource. And if you go to their, uh, if you join the Behavior Resource, uh, use the code BOP again to save 10% off of your yearly subscription. And uh, last but not least, a lot of people have been signing up for the Behavioral Observations Patreon group since I launched it in January. Uh, I've been pushing out a lot of uh, members-only content as well as ad-free uh, podcast feeds. As a matter of fact, this particular episode has been out for several days now, and it's just the episode. No uh, introductory blah, 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 no jingles, no nothing. It was just the conversation of, uh, of, of with Vince and me. Um, so if that sounds cool to you, uh, and if getting discounts for uh, companies like FTF and others uh, sound like a good idea, go over to patreon.com forward slash behavioral observations to learn more. All right, I think that does it for opening remarks, so let's not waste any more time. Without any further delay, please enjoy this conversation with Dr. Vince Carbone. Yeah. 
Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Dr. Vince Carbone, it's so nice to have you on the show. Uh, there's been many, many requests for your appearance, and I am really excited that you've taken the time to join me today. So welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Matt. Uh, I look forward to it uh, very much and uh, hope I can be informative and helpful to your listeners. Yeah, I, 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 I think we'll, I think we'll succeed on that score. Uh, you know, it's, it uh, it's funny. Just before we hit record, while we were talking about the uh, the Italian American experience uh, and uh, things like that, it was, it was almost, it would be almost as, uh, it'd be probably pretty interesting to roll, roll some tape <laughs> on that. But we've got some bigger fish to fry here. We're talking about behavior analysis and all things verbal behavior. We're going to talk a little bit about your. Uh, uh, history and your current work, uh, you know, some of the things that you have planned to talk about at this year's Verbal Behavior Conference and a whole lot more. But before we get to that, I want to talk about your first encounter with behavior analysis. How did you discover it? When did you discover it? What made you want to pursue it as a career? And I would also love it if you can just kind of give a, I don't know, any historical anecdotes about what the field was like at the time when you were getting into it. Obviously, we're in a very, very different place on the development of behavior analysis timeline today. Uh, so uh, so I'll, I'm just going to kind of let you take it from there. So how, how did you discover behavior analysis and all that other stuff? <laughs> um, well, like most people, it was somewhat of a serendipitous sort of uh uh, experience. Um, I knew I wanted to study psychology coming out of high school, um, but I also wanted to play baseball. Um, I played varsity baseball for several years in my New York high school. And actually, I thought I was going to be the, you know, the next uh, shortstop for the New York Yankees or the Los Angeles Dodgers. Um, but of course, that didn't turn out that way. And and good that, and I'm glad that it didn't. So I went to Marietta College on a on a baseball uh, on a baseball scholarship, um, and the head of the department, Al Prince. And now this was in 1968. So the head of the department, Al Prince, was there. Al had um, ha Al had worked uh, in NASA labs. He had a PhD in in psychology, traditional sort of approach to psychology. And in the 1950s and 60s, he was developing uh, human factors. He was involved in human factor development for one of the first space capsules um, that would uh, ultimately uh, be launched by the United States. He changed course uh, in the late 60s uh, and decided to teach at Marietta College, move into academia. His work there was pretty interesting because he was in fact a behavior analyst, um, but we never called ourselves behavior analysts at that time. We called ourselves Skinnerians uh, or behaviorists. But through his affiliation with APA, he developed a friendship uh, with B.F. Skinner uh, and they would communicate regularly. So here I am at Marietta College in 1968 and the chair of department uh, is in fact a, a behaviorist, a Skinnerian who knows Skinner reasonably well. So as a result of that, he would invite Skinner uh, to the campus frequently. Well, Skinner would occasionally stop, stop off in, in Marietta on his way to West Virginia University uh, to visit with Julie, his, his daughter, who was there at the time. Well, before I tell you a little bit more about that, let me describe to you the, the coursework that was provided. Um, all of the courses were taught from a behavior analytic point of view. Even the personality course was, in fact, behavior analytic in 1968. Now, that may be a little bit intellectually dishonest for a liberal arts undergraduate program, but I'm thankful that it was. So we pretty much were indoctrinated into behavior. And that was my introduction to behavior analysis. I knew I wanted to study psychology, but had no idea what I was going getting myself into. So I immediately adopted that approach. It just made such good sense, the scientific principles guiding our understanding of human behavior just made such good sense. He brought in then uh, a fellow by the name of Dean, uh, Dean Lambie uh, from Duke who had just gotten his PhD, and he brought a physiological approach to psychology along with 
uh, operant conditioning. So now we had courses not only in physiology, but the interaction between physiology and environmental principles that guide our science. So we were just inundated with operant conditioning. It was everywhere in our courses. We even had a small uh, rat lab where I would run rats along with, uh, we also had some gerbils, which was pretty interesting. They were easier to keep. So we would run gerbils. So here I am now, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, and I'm immersed in behavior analysis. Uh, baseball took a, a sideline. I, I, I was okay in high school, but I was not competitive at the college level, especially a division three school that won the uh, division three world series every year. Uh, I was not competitive any longer. So more or less put my, my emphasis upon my, my studies at that uh, at that particular uh, that particular point, when Skinner would arrive on campus, uh, Al had me. Al Prince had me um, be his uh, student guide, which was pretty interesting. I would pick Skinner up at the uh, airport, chat with him, uh, chat with him a bit, put him in the car. We'd go back to campus. I'd spend time showing him around and being part of that. So I was just immersed in B.F. Skinner for two or three days. Here I am, eighteen or nineteen years old. But I knew I was in the presence of greatness, even even then. I you know I was going to ask you about that, yeah, because I, I yeah. It, it, so it's it's neat. What what made you be able to put that in context like that? You know, I I, I think it was the fact that Skinner visited for the first time two years into my undergraduate program. By now, we had been immersed in Skinner's analysis and all of our courses were on operant conditioning. So there weren't a lot of journal art, weren't a lot of journal articles. So Al would pull, you know, there was no job I had just begun. JAB was 10 years old. So Al would pull together a lot of material directly from Skinner's writing. So we we pretty much knew who he was by the time we were juniors. And now we have a chance to meet the man and be in his presence and ask him questions. Um, it was uh, my my fellow. Some of my fellow students would often joke, since I had been assigned to be his guide, that they told me to remember that he's used to speaking to Harvard graduate students. So kind of be careful as to what you say around around Skinner, because uh, he, he's he's used to uh, uh, students and and high quality students as well. So we had an opportunity to spend quite a bit of time with him, ask him questions, and you know show him around. He would give a speech uh, each time he came to campus in, in a Unitarian church for the community. And he gave the talk the first year on, ha on having a poem, which is a very complicated analysis, uh, kind of likening uh, producing a poem to uh, having a child, uh, which, you know, the community loved seeing him. I, I dare say hardly anyone in the audience um, other than uh, people who were very interested in behavior, not would have any idea what he was talking, but he was loved in the community. Uh, I mean, it was big turnouts every time uh, he was there. And, and and then it wasn't until I went to Drake University with Scott Wood, who was a very good friend of Skinner's, that I reacquainted. Uh, I reacquainted on a personal level uh, with Skinner due to Scott's uh, Scott's friendship uh, with him. So we'd, we'd have interactions with him. And, and, and what, I'm sure a lot of audience members, you know, like Skinner is obviously this revered person. Uh, and that's, I guess, an understatement on a colossal level. But what is it like? What was it like just kind of interacting with him about maybe just non behavioral thing? You know, like, you know, you said you had a personal relationship with him. <laughs> you know, I can't imagine like talking about the weather or something like that. But can, can you, can you? At least, uh, as best as possible, try to describe what that was like in terms of just Skinner, the 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 everyday guy, or I, I don't know if he w came up. You know, a lot of times, I, you know, I, I don't know. I'm 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 you know, I, I think you know what I'm getting at, but I'm just trying to figure out what it was like to uh, be on a you know kind of a personal acquaintance of someone who is you know literally a giant in the field, at the, both at the time and as well as a historical figure. Yeah, so we. It certainly wasn't a, a, a personal friendship, but it was certainly a, a personal acquaintance during those uh, during those uh, uh, visits. Yeah, he was very, very kind. He was very kind to students. Uh, we would have large gathering meetings with the psychology department students. He was very kind uh, and very forgiving for any errors that you you might make in the analysis. And he would correct you, but correct you in a very nice uh, sort of way. 
it, it was at the time when when Beyond Freedom and, and Dignity uh, had just been published in, in the early 70s, 70, 70, 71. So he, he spoke a lot about cultural issues. He spoke a lot about the effect of the effect behavior analysis could have on cultural issues. So in personal talks with him, he would spend some time talking about the importance of behavioral principles uh, guiding uh, culture and, and, and society uh, in, uh, in general. Uh, he also talked of, uh, about his children uh, very much and, and uh, their relationships. Um, I, at one point, I saw him at ABA, uh, at, at, at what was then ABBA, um, uh, maybe it was ABA International at the time, but it was around 1979. I had my son with me, who was only three weeks old. So, of course, I wanted to get a picture of my, my son with, uh, uh, with Skinner. And this, this kind of gives you an idea of the type of man he was. He gladly stopped, uh, took my son. My son was hungry at the time and was screaming at about 120 decibels the entire time Skinner had in his arms. And I uh, have him on my, I have that picture on my desktop. Skinner was just smiling the entire time as he held my son with no hesitation. And then when he handed him back to me, he said, lovely baby. Uh, it, only someone who at his level would be so kind as to say that. And the reason why he rushed a little bit to give him back to me, because Julie had just come out of the elevator at ABAI and he hadn't seen her in a while. And he immediately rushed off uh, to embrace her and to, uh, to greet her. I mean, that's just the, the kind of guy uh, yeah, he was. He was just uh, uh, a delight to be around. Now, he was not so forgiving to the faculty. When faculty would ask questions that were misguided or challenging, he would go right back at them, as is his custom uh, in many uh, debate sort of situations. But with students, he was gentle and kind and, like I said, forgiving and um, it was just, uh, I just had an impression of him as a very decent, kind, and, and gentle man who was interested in making the world a better place. Okay, we're going to take a quick break to thank the Essential for Living for sponsoring this segment of the podcast. The EFL is the most comprehensive life skills curriculum and teaching handbook on the market today. It's designed for both children and adults with moderate to severe disabilities, including but not limited to autism. The EFL is extraordinarily helpful in guiding the instruction of all adults with moderate to severe intellectual disabilities. So to learn more, go to EssentialForLiving.com. And if you decide to purchase any EFL materials, use the code BOEFL to save 10% off your order now through the end of March 2021. Again, you can go to EssentialForLiving.com and use the code BOEFL to save 10%. You can also go to the show notes for this episode as well. All right, let's get back to this conversation with Vince. Okay. All right. Well, thanks for pausing over that for a few minutes. I think that was a, a really, uh, it's a, it's a perspective that a lot of us obviously just can't have given uh, uh, the timing and whatnot. So I appreciate yeah. that. So, um, so let's, uh, I guess maybe get back on the, the timeline here since I distracted you from it. So you're uh uh, uh, perhaps in the early stages of grad school where, uh, well, and, um, so what, um, uh, can you maybe pick up the thread from there, I suppose? Yeah, uh, sure. Sure. In, in undergraduate school, uh, deeply involved in behavior analysis and then grad school at, at Drake university. Um, prior to that, uh, I, I had, um, a master's degree before going back for additional graduate training in behavior analysis in special education. And um, mainly because um, basically graduating with an undergraduate BA in psychology didn't provide you many, many opportunities. So I went into special uh, education and I brought my behavioral uh, inclinations uh, with me. I found that uh, they were not accepted at all. I would answer questions in class and give a behavior analytic response, given my background in undergraduate school. And frequently, professors would say things like, well, to the rest of the class, what Vince was trying to say, let, let me say that in everyday sort of language, and, and would literally um, uh, socially punish any responses that include a behavioral analytic approach. So it was clear that there was no real opportunity for us at that particular time. And now we're, we're talking about here 
the late 60s and early um, early 70s. Well, at that time, there was there was no field, there was no ABA field. ABA was the American Bar Association. Uh, we, we never referred to ourselves uh, within the field of uh, of ABA. Um, we called ourselves Skinnerians or uh, behaviorists. But it wasn't so that, that was my experience in early in graduate school and undergraduate school. But by 1974, the Midwestern Association of Behavior Analysis was started, and it was started mainly by Jack Michael, Scott uh, Scott Wood, and Jerry Mertens from St. Cloud State uh, State University. Um, the and unfortunately, all three of us, all three of them are no longer are, are no longer with us. Um, but the organization was started as a response to not having an audience, an outlet for our work. APA would not necessarily accept uh, our uh, our uh, presentations. Um, so we needed a way to, to disseminate the issues on behavior analysis. And Jack and Scott and Jerry realized that. They started MABA in 1974, Midwestern Association. There would maybe be 100 students, 100 people mostly students, but 100 people, maybe 200. And Keller um, uh, and Skinner were always there. They always attended those meetings. So if we're going to talk about what things were like, well, it was basically 100 to 200 people, mainly graduate students from Western Michigan, Drake, Kansas, and West Virginia University. Those were the, the bastions of behavior analysis in the early days. And there were mainly faculty and students, uh, 100 to 200 or so. You always thought to yourself when you were doing a talk, because you were required as a graduate student to do some talks at, at MAMA, that Skinner would not enter your room. You were always watching carefully at the back to see if Skinner showed up. And many times he would, and he would sit in the front row for better vision and hearing. Oh, my gosh. And then you had to uh, present your information. It was an intimidating uh, it was an intimidating event, especially for young young behaviorists. Oh man, I can only imagine that. Holy cow! Yeah, it was an interesting. It was did he interesting. ever? Did he ever comment on a on a presentation that you made, and did you have to like answer some questions off the top of your head or something like that? No, he never. Uh, no, nothing I ever presented did he did he question. I'm not sure how I would have been able to uh, answer, uh, given the intimidation factor of that. Um, but I was lucky not to. But I had several of my fellow graduate students have uh, that experience, and they they talked uh, they talked about what it was like. Oh my gosh, I can only imagine how intimidating that must have been. Yeah. And, and Skinner and Keller would walk around the halls of the uh, of the meeting rooms. It was always in Chicago, um, and he would walk around, and they'd walk around with the program, which was a mim mimeograph piece of paper, the old mimeograph type, it would be rolled up and it would be in their jacket pockets. And then they would pull it out just before meetings and kind of uh, take a look at it. But you could interact freely with them. Um, there were dinners every night, uh, e every uh, conference, where Keller and, and Skinner would talk. And it was filled with, with wit and charm mixed in with science. Most of us attended those dinners just to hear them banter back and forth uh, in a very erudite and interesting uh, an interesting sort of way. So that's kind of what things were were like back in 50, 50 or so years ago, 50, 40 to 50 years ago uh, in terms of the field. And it was wonderful, as I think back on it, to have had those sorts of uh, uh, experiences. Wow. Well, I, again, I appreciate you sharing those anecdotes. And uh, so, so tell me a little bit about how your, you know, kind of post-training career got started. Uh, you know, like what were some of your early work experiences? Yeah. Um, since there was little recognition uh, of the value of a behaviorist being part of human services sort of agencies, you, you found yourself with just very few choices in terms of employment, uh, generally, which is so different from today's embarrassment of riches, I think, as you uh, said. Yes. Yeah. Just, unbelievable. Yeah. It's just unbelievable how different it was. You, you weren't sure you would be employed 
uh, undergrad, certainly not undergrad, but even graduate school, you, you weren't sure, other than going into academic positions, of which there were very few. Um, so you, you wondered what, would you, what, you were going to, what you were going to do since most fields were not welcoming, uh, welcoming towards you. So I decided that I entered a field um, related to juvenile justice. I, as a young behavior analyst, I, um, uh, I was employed as a director of a residential juvenile detention center and spent several years, spent several years in that role. It was an area that was devoid of, of, uh, of well-established treatment methods, and therefore behavior ana behavior analysis was wel as welcome as anything else. So I, I had free reign to employ behavior so behavior analytic principles. So I, I I really cut my teeth, so to speak, on that population of individuals and staff training on how to go about implementing behavior analysis at the individual level, but also at the systems uh, at the systems level. Now, now we're talking now about 76, 77, 78, into, um, into the 80s when I spent my time and, and basically learned the application of the principles through that population uh, of individuals. Um, education was not terribly welcoming. The autism uh, explosion that occurred in the late 80s had not yet, had not yet occurred. So you either worked in a residential facility for persons with developmental disabilities or you found a niche someplace uh, in an agency and in, in a in a service uh, provision that was welcoming to you. And I chose uh, uh, juvenile uh, justice. Uh, that was my opportunity, and that's where I learned I learned the craft more or less there. That, that's interesting. I, I didn't know that. And obviously, your body of work, at least from my perspective, is synonymous with the treatment of autism. And uh, uh, so um, I'm curious. So what? Um, what were some of the things you learned about serving that population? And yeah, uh, that, um, you know, uh, obviously practitioners, many, many, the vast majority of practitioners right now are, are serving kids with autism. Um, but there, you know, there are some number of behavior analysts out there who may not necessarily be working in a, uh, you know, uh, a, a juvenile justice situation, but they're supporting uh, kids with emotional behavioral disorders and, you know, perhaps things that might be, you know, I guess, uh, early precursors to perhaps entering the justice system. Um, you know, what, 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 what was it like serving that population? Were there any lessons that you were able to draw and apply later on in your career to serving individuals with autism or maybe just running organizations? Uh, yeah, I, I, I First of all, I learned quite a bit about organizations and how they operate and how to try to make changes on a system level. I mean, the early notions of OBM were part of my learning experience, figuring out how you managed at, a, at somewhat of a macro sort of level uh, as well. At the time, a program was just beginning at West Virginia universities. It wasn't West Virginia University. It wasn't called OBM. It was the Systems and Behavior Behavior Systems Analysis, Behavioral Systems Analysis. John Craffel, um, Jim Noah, and a whole group were were running that. And I was relying on a lot of their their work to understand how systems work. So I was getting some information from that group at at WVU. In addition, uh, Fixin and and others had worked at Boys Town. And the Boys Town model was occurring at about the same time, uh, now run by Pat Pat Fryman, but the early Boys Town model with uh, Fixin and, and, his, uh, and, and his group was beginning to um, tell us about how to work with individuals within justice systems with uh, emotional behavioral problems as we now describe it. So I relied heavily on that body of literature related to the use of token economies, um, the use of competency training of, uh, of staff, um, and all of the sort of issues that were embedded in the Boys Town model, I was, trying to, I was trying to replicate. So I had a body of literature to go to, which was very helpful in guiding where we ultimately landed regarding uh, that population. I see. I see. Yeah. And, and so how did you transition from working in the juvenile justice community to serving individuals with autism? 
Yeah, a, a good 30 or so years ago. And that's why most of my work, um, uh, although I published a few papers in juvenile justice journals using, I actually published a paper called A Functional Analysis of Behavior in a Juvenile Detention Center. Okay. Um, which was kind of interesting that anybody even published it, but it was a juvenile justice journal uh, in which I was able to um, uh, publish that in 1981. Uh, I, I published that uh, that paper. All right, I'll try to run down that citation for the show notes for sure. Yes, sure. Okay, just want to take another quick break here and thank the folks from howtoaba.com for sponsoring this segment of the podcast. You know, they were on a few episodes ago, and if you want a deep dive on all the things they do to support professionals in this field, you can check that episode out. But for the uh, time being, they definitely recognize that being a BCBA can be overwhelming, sometimes lonely, particularly if you're a solo practitioner or if, for example, you work in a school setting, you're like the only BCBA surrounded by people who uh, don't think like you, don't have your training, etc., uh, they created howtoaba.com to support folks like yourself. They put together this uh, library of uh, printable d- programs and data sheets. They've got CEUs available uh, with, along with a collaborative membership community. So if this is something you are interested in, go to howtoaba.com forward slash join BX resource. And don't worry if you didn't get a chance to jot that down. I've got the link to it in the show notes for this episode. Uh, but again, that's howtoaba.com forward slash join BX resource. If you do decide to join, use the promo code BOP at checkout and you'll save 10% off your yearly subscription. So again, uh, thanks to the folks at howtoaba.com for sponsoring this segment. Right now, though, let's get back to this conversation with Vince. If the field of education now, now we're now we're into the you know, into the 80s and maybe the mid to late 80s, the field of education was now becoming a little more accepting given the publications and the work that had been done in the field of education. So I switched gears to uh, education as my career opportunity. And I went to work for a school district that was aware of the need for behavior analysts in Florida back in the late 80s which was re- remarkable. Uh, I was actually hired as a, uh, as a behavior analyst to basically set up a behavioral division, if you will, that employed behavior analytic principles. Now you have to say, well, why, why was that the case? Well, the director of, of the district was a fellow by the, by the name of Dr. David Gaylor, Dave Gaylor. He was a student of Og Lindsley's. It's just fortuitous. And he was interested in making sure behavior analysis was a big part of the district. So it was the leadership in that district that hired me. And now I had free reign in an educational environment. I didn't have to fight with people and have people say, well, what Vince really meant. I could now talk behaviorally and was encouraged from the leadership point of view to make sure other people talked the same way and thought the same way and acted the same way. This was a dream job. Um, a broad spectrum of children with all kinds of disabilities and behavior analysis is the treatment of choice and was sanctioned um, by the, by the leadership. So I spent several years then uh, engaged in that sort of work and loved every minute of it and thank Dave Gaylor uh, for the opportunity to, to do that and really learn much more about the treatment of all kinds of uh, persons with with all kinds of disabilities i see what an incredible opportunity yeah um and then uh did you start the carbone clinic uh after that um uh, where where did the where did in your career did you decide hey i gotta i gotta open my own place and what were the motivating conditions behind that yeah that's a that's a good question um i by the Early 90s or, or so, or mid mid 90s actually. By the mid 90s or so, um, there was now a great interest in behavior analysis, ABA as it was now called. Uh, mm-hmm. There was a great interest in, in in ABA being provided to children with autism in home programs. The 87 publication by Lova certainly opened up that opportunity. So now it's the mid 90s, 
And I've been working in schools now for, I don't know, 10 years or, or so, really enjoying it. But now there was an opportunity to serve even additional children with behavior analytic principles in home programming. So I, I started a private practice of providing home programming and consultation to schools. Dave Gaylor had moved on to a superintendent position. The support wasn't quite as great as it used to, as, as it was previously. So now here's an opportunity uh, to go on to do uh, some other some other things. And this opportunity opened up. I was working quite a bit with uh, Patrick McGreevy at that particular time. Uh, Pat's a uh, Pat's a definitely a, a a big friend of the show. So yes, absolutely. I've heard his uh, I've heard his podcast. He's wonderful. He, he's a uh, he's a gem. What what he's given to our field with the EFL is just absolutely enormous. But um, and I say that every opportunity I I, I get. Um, but Pat was working in Orange County. I was in Osceola County. We were bordering. Ca- so Pat and I started up a relationship in Florida. That's where we met. So. Pat started into private practice in the 90s, and he said, why don't, why don't you do the same thing? He said, Dave's not around anymore. Why don't you go ahead and you can really use your skills? So I said, okay, I started my own practice. We didn't go into practice together, but I started my own practice, and we communicate and have uh, for the last 30 years or so. Um, so I, I started a private practice basically providing treatment to children with autism, given all I had learned in public school environments of working with children with autism and many disabilities. Now is an opportunity to do home programming. Um, and I, I, I did that for several years, but it quickly became apparent to me that it was an inefficient and expensive model. And, and it was difficult to do that much traveling. There was a shortage of qualified people to provide services. So there was enormous demand, but it was inefficient. Um, so much travel time to get somebody there. Somebody doesn't walk out of their office and go see a child in the center, in their center. That's very easy to do. But now you've got to travel thousands of miles and all the expense involved in that for the parents. Uh, and the fact that you couldn't easily supervise what was going on. You'd leave people with programs. You'd hope somebody there locally. And then in three months, you'd come back and hope that something close to treatment fidelity had occurred. So it was at that point around 2000, 2001, 2002, about 20 years ago, that I decided the more efficient way to do this is to do it in a clinic-based program. There's now an interest and a demand for that. So that was the motivating factors that ultimately led me uh, to establish um, treatment clinics for children with autism back in the early 2000, about 20 years ago to begin that process. And I went back to New York, where I'm from originally, where I had many colleagues who I'd been working with over the years who could now join me, well-established colleagues could now join me in this venture of starting a clinic center-based program for the treatment of children with autism. So that's how I moved into in that direction. I see. Uh, I know you touched on this when you were talking about your work in the juvenile justice system. And if there's more to elaborate on the, I guess, the the, the management and supervision aspects of, of running uh, a complex system, uh, I'd love to give you the opportunity to do so. A lot of listeners here are in the position of supervising staff, either in a clinic setting or in-home programs or what have you. Uh, so I, I have to imagine that uh, running these centers, you've kind of seen it all, if you will. Uh, so I, I'm wondering if if you could share some some things that you might have learned about supporting um, you know, supervisory staff and in turn them supporting direct uh, care and instru- or, or um, you know direct providers of therapy, uh, you know, um, if you have something that, more to share on that you mentioned earlier, um, please uh, please go right ahead. Yeah, it's a, I, I'm glad to share some experiences and things I things I think I know of, about operating center-based programs for, for children with autism. Um, my first advice, which is counter to the current movement, is to stay small. That is certainly the antithesis of what is happening, what is happening today. I think there is an inverse relationship 
between size and quality. Mm. I don't, I'm convinced that you can't provide the level level of quality service if you're big and spread out and you have and you have large numbers in the centers. In other words, the centers ought to be very small, very small units, and then you replicate those small units other places, but you not try to work off of volume as the uh, to to balance the equation. Um, frankly, the idea that equity uh, equity firms are now buying up small clinics and turning them into conglom- conglomerations is really worrisome to me. Mm-hmm. Equity firms look at the bottom line, frankly, and you hope there's some notion of, of quality there, but there may not be. Now, this is not a popular notion. I, 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 I kind of understand that. Mm-hmm. And third party reimbursement has forced this to some degree. Equity firms were never interested in us until we had a revenue flow. We had revenue that we could we could produce in in large numbers. Um, I think that sort of movement within the field is troubling and dangerous and not good, uh, not good for the person served and not good for the people serving. So my recommendation, number one, is despite all the contingencies that force in that direction, I'll describe for you maybe a little later on some ways I think you can overcome that. Okay. Some, some ways you can overcome that. Um, the second thing is in terms of staffing. And I think the idea that once you become a BCBA and you pass the exam, that you're now qualified to be a supervisor um, is a mistaken notion. Once again, an un, probably an unpopular position. The reason why people are passing the BCBA exam and now becoming supervisors is due to the fact that third party reimbursement is predicated on the need for somebody to supervise and sign off on the RBT uh, delivered delivered program. I don't think that's the I don't think that's the best way to go. I think you need to do as a BCBA a residency. Once you graduate, you're like a physician. Now you're ready for an internship and a residency. And your residency should be three to five years of working in the field with individuals and learning the craft and the science before you become the supervisor of programs. I think, I think that is a necessary, a necessary component. And the way I like to describe it is focusing on, focus on learning before earning. Focus on learning before earning. Before you look at the job offers with bonuses for signing on and all of those sorts of things. And I understand economic contingencies. It's not like I'm not motivated by economic contingencies. But I think we got to pull back on that. Because before you think about where can I get a job and earn as much money as I, I possibly can, say to yourself, I need to learn an awful lot before I'm ready to do that. In our clinics, we always had a rule that you were three to five years as a therapist, as a BCBA, but and we call that today in Dubai, for example, in our clinic, you're three to five years, most of our, many of our staff who provide therapy are BCBAs. And they have three to five years of that sort of work before they're ready to be considered for supervisory sort of roles. The economic contingencies fight against that. I understand that. But I think there are some creative ways that you can get around that. And here's one of them. Basically, bring in BCBAs when you start your your business who may not have done that three to five. You have no choice because reimbursement is an issue. You, You may have no choice. But what you do is then everybody else you bring in after that has a three to five year residency and you hire from within. So it guarantees, so so up front you may have some problems, but then over the years you have a career ladder. And that's what we've done in our clinics. And that's the way we can ensure that the next hire is not from outside when we lose a BCBA and we go looking for another newly minted person. Instead, we've got somebody in the pipeline ready, ready to go. Now that certainly conflicts with all the other agencies that are hiring that way, and they they may siphon off some of your people that way. I know. But I think that is one way to solve that 
that problem is always higher from within. You know what you're getting, you know what you have, and you can overcome that problem despite the reimbursement issues. I see. I see. I want to get more of your thoughts on the state of the field, you know, kind of past, present, and future. Uh, I want to get to that in just a minute, but uh, I, I would be remiss if we didn't talk about, and you bro- broached it briefly here when you talked about your program in Dubai. Uh, I, I am curious about how you got started working internationally and whatever lessons that you learned uh, doing that. Uh, I, I would love to hear that as well, or just thoughts, observations, what have you. Yeah. Um, I started providing services about 25 years ago in Europe by doing workshops and hel- helping some children and, and families. Certainly the internet opened up that opportunity. People were learning what, what people were doing other places, and they saw people they thought were useful and could be helpful, and they invited them. So that's what kind of gave me my entree into some international work. Um, I started mainly in England and in Wales, um, basically providing workshops and, and ser- services. Once I started to do that, people from all over the EU were coming to those workshops. So they became interested, Slovakia, uh, uh, Slovakia, for example, and other countries, France. I spent some time in, in France. So a lot of the EU countries then became interested uh, in my work. Well, what happened with the beginning of the, of the clinics in that area, and, and especially Dubai, um, is about seven years ago, um, an entrepreneur by the name of uh, uh, Sukhdev Hansra, uh, Columbia University, he's a British fellow, a Columbia University uh, MBA, who was working in Dubai and helping to start up businesses. He contacted me. He said he had heard that we did some reasonably good things and whether or not I'd like to join him in a venture of starting a clinic in the Middle East in an area very much need in much need of services. But he brought a different perspective. He He called the first time And my secretary answered the phone and said, there's a fellow from Dubai who wants to talk to you about starting a clinic there. Uh, I said, just tell him I'm not I'm not interested and I'm busy right now. I I mean, I I thought of it as some get rich quick scheme that somebody had the idea that we'd all get rich if we could do this. So I said, just no, tell him I'm not interested. He called back a week later. He was persistent and said, I'd like to. And I said, no. I don't want to talk to him. And I, and I told my secretary, if he calls one more time, I'll talk to him. Okay. Well, a couple of weeks later, he called a third time and I got on the phone with him and I said, yeah, what do you want? And now he started to present an idea that was appealing. It wasn't a get rich quick scheme. It was a social impact clinic. He had an interest in providing social impact where the leadership and the directors do not get paid a salary. There is no salary involved. All the money gets pushed back in the business to support children whose families cannot afford the service. So you start up privately, you get some government support, and then instead of you taking the money as the leaders of the group, it gets pushed back in so that other people could benefit. And the second idea was he wanted behavior analysts. He he understood behavior analysis. So now this was an interesting proposal. He came to New York. He spent three days with me. I asked him to do that. He said, fine. And we, we came to an agreement that we would start a social impact factor. Well, since that time, we served seven years ago, hundreds of hundreds of children. We produced 24 uh, BCBAs uh, through our training. We now support their education through funding uh, of their education. We now have 24 BCBA, new minted BCBAs in the region. Most of them now serving as therapists, and now seven years later, some of them are now supervisors through that pipeline notion of a a career ladder. And that's pretty much what we did in Dubai. Well, we started something similar now in London, where we're an outreach clinic, a little bit different model, Um, but we now have an outreach clinic going in London, where we're now providing services not to children in centers, but to children in schools funded by schools. So now the funding source is schools and therefore children who would never get served privately 
in those countries are now being able to be uh, are now being able to be served in school environments through our uh, through our organization. So our push has been to get it into the public sector, and I'm I'm really pleased to to mention that um, um, the Association for Behavior Analysis and the Society for the Advancement of Behavior Analysis just in, informed me um, that the Carbone Clinic has been awarded the 2022 Award for International Dissemination of Behavior Analysis. Actually, this is the first time I've I've mentioned this to anyone outside the group that I um, that I work with, and we're really pleased um, that they've recognized that the social impact factor approach to things uh, is one that's deserving of uh, uh, deserving of some recognition. So I'm pleased to I'm pleased to let you know, and I'm pleased by that recognition. And it, what's really nice, it wasn't given to me; it was given to the organization. In other mm-hmm. words, we, all the people who made that happen are now receiving the accolades, and it's not just driven by by me. It's it's been very nice uh, to uh, um, to have received that level of recognition. Well, congratulations! That is just fantastic, and I, I appreciate you sharing that here on the show. Uh, it's uh, sounds like a, a just a fantastic project that succeeded <laughs> beyond uh, anyone's wildest dreams. Mine um, as well. Yeah. What what is the what are your thoughts in terms of the sustainability of this getting larger and larger, you know, in decades from now, this these particular programs that you're developing uh, internationally? Yeah, I think the impact will mainly not be large numbers of children, although we'll serve many. For example, in Dubai, we only have 50 children in the center. We'll never get any bigger. We'll never get any bigger than uh, than that. In the outreach program, we'll serve kids in school. So we'll serve as many kids as we can. And for example, in London, the UK program, as, as many as we can. So that will continue to grow. The real importance of it for me is that it will grow well-trained behavior analysts. That's, I think, will be the contribution of our centers. It will be okay. children, but it will be well-trained behavior analysts who don't become supervisors until they've done their residency and have a master's degree, a board certified, and who also uh, have done their time in the trenches to learn the science. I see. I that's see. what I think our, con- that's what I hope my legacy will be. Okay, folks, last break of this podcast episode. Thanks for bearing with me. Uh, if you are interested in learning about getting an ad free podcast feed, or if you're interested in getting, Uh, Some pretty neat discounts off of the continuing ed offerings, both at the Behavioral Observations Podcast CEU store, but also the FTF on-demand courses. And as an aside, I'm going through the the, what they call the big course. That's the 10-hour course of the uh, practical functional assessment and skills-based treatment process. Uh, And it's, uh, it's just really, really good. I get the luxury of being able to chat with Greg periodically, but the level of detail that this course goes into specifically um, it goes beyond what I could garner in a conversation here and there. And it's uh, it's beautifully shot by Ryan O'Donnell. You actually feel like you're in the conference room itself. Uh, just really, really well done. So you can get 20% off of that. Uh, there's some other discounts uh, with some other CE providers that I'm working on right now, as well as access to bonus content and all sorts of other cool stuff. So if you want to learn more about that, head over to patreon.com forward slash behavioral observations and see if there is a tier that is right for your situation. I feel like I have a million more questions for you, but uh, (laughs) one of the things I want to talk to you about is, um, well, I guess while we're on the topic of the field here, I guess I'm kind of sw- switching the order in which I want to talk about these things. But we're we we landed here, so let's let's talk about it right. Up. Uh, so I I threw out a, a call for questions and uh, to to the listeners, um, one of whom very familiar to you uh, sent in a, a just a gem of a question, uh, uh, Francesca uh, de Espinoza, um, and uh, so. Uh, Vince, we've talked about how the field has changed from your early career to, you know, present time. Um, w- w- I guess the 
gist of uh, Francesca's question is where would you like to see the field in, in uh, 20 to 30 years? And, and maybe, you know, as we were talking about before we hit record, you might want to contrast to where you think it's going versus where you want to. Um, but, you know, you can, you can take the answer, I guess, in any direction you want. Yeah, I have some thoughts on that. Um, first of all, when, when you asked about the field, I'm going to be much broader in my answer beyond the field related to the treatment of children with, um, with autism. But let's start there. Um, I, I think we should continue to provide services. Um, and we ought to be working to push the government, the schools, to provide those services and move away from a private delivery and, and move away from a private delivery um, model, thir third party reimbursement sort of model, as much as we can. Now, I'm talking about this being a slow movement. But I think Skinner would be very pleased to, to know that it is the public agencies that are now providing that service because you could provide it to a much broader, a much broader uh, group of children. And we ought to push the quality, I think, in that in that direction rather than a private service delivery model, which we basically are now. I think public um, public health is an important issue, as we all know even more today. And we ought to um, we ought to move in in that direction with with the ch children often. Secondly, we ought to push general education to adopt our policies. We got to get influential people into public education. The work that Kent Johnson is doing, Doug Greer is doing, I think is outstanding in pushing behavior analytic approaches to education. Skinner tried that for years. Uh, between the early 50s and the late 60s, he was devoted to education being uh, the, the vehicle for the delivery of behavior analytic principles to change our culture. That was his drive. He was exhausted by 1968 and gave up and said, the school districts have beat me down. I can't, I can't do it any, uh, any longer. But he never gave up. He kept talking about it. But he couldn't, it couldn't be his focus any longer. I think that is a major part of where the next 20, 30 years we ought to, we ought to be going. Um, if you look at a paper he published, Why We Are Not Acting to, to Save the World, published se several years ago, okay? And, and it appears in, um, um, well, I, I, I'll, I'll think of the, uh, the title of the, um, uh, of the book in just a second, but that paper uh, is, is where we ought to be looking for our answers. We all know now that science is about to pull us out of a, of a pandemic. Without science, we'd be nowhere near it. And, and it's been too late, given all the people that have died. But it is science that pulled us out of it. It is science that can pull us out of the disharmony in our culture and in our, and in our society as well. Skinner published a book a few years ago, Reflections on Behaviorism and Society, published in about, I don't know, in the 70s sometime. That book is full of ideas on how behavior analytic principles need to guide our culture and our society and how to go about doing that, along with the paper, uh, Why We Are Not uh, Acting to Save the World. That, that paper ought to be... Uh, that paper ought to be read by everyone. I think we need to focus on getting people, behavior analytic individuals, into government and public agencies and start to make those changes from within. Skinner frequently said that the real issue in changing our society is not finding people who will be good leaders, who are decent, honest people who work for the benefit. It's changing environments that ultimately produce good people. So it's sustainable. It's not looking for that one leader who cares. And we all know we need that in these times. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was just on a call earlier today with some folks uh, from a school district and it was uh, a district that had, uh, had run PBIS successfully with great outcomes many years ago. And the, the, leaders who were involved with that effort at the time moved on to other positions, kind of like your story in the uh, school district in Florida, you know, <laughs> and uh, it was, it was, it was person dependent, not, 
you know, not setting or culture dependent. And the, the predictable results occurred, as you, as you can imagine. So, yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, I, I think it's necessary. And one last point on that, uh, Matt, is the B.F. Skinner Foundation, you know, provides an avenue for these kind of discussions. So I urge everyone to become a member, sign up. They they are dedicated to these principles being part of our culture and our life. And I highly recommend you go to their website, bfskinner.org, and join the group there that is beginning to talk about these things. And you should start conversations about this so we can find solutions uh, to uh, why we aren't working to save the world. I think in the next 20 or 30 years, that's where we that's where our emphasis ought to be. And if I had 20 or 30 years more left to do that, that's where I would focus uh, my interests uh, uh, as well. Um, science is our answer to all of these issues, I think. All right. All right. Uh, great points for sure. Um, so I want to switch gears here a little bit. We've got the uh, Verbal Behavior Conference coming up in April. Uh, and so I'd love to hear you talk about what you're planning to discuss at the conference and give people a little sneak peek. Obviously, we want to, uh, we don't want to give it all away. We want to make sure people sign up uh, at uh, uh, for the conference and attend because there's not only you, but a lot of other great speakers there will be uh, talking about a lot of really neat stuff. But if you could just kind of give us a flavor about what you want to talk about uh, or what you're planning on talking about, that would be great. Yeah, that's a great conference every year that Kelly Wood uh, ha has put on. Uh, it's a fabulous conference. She brings in um, leading authorities in in their areas. Uh, I urge everyone to attend that conference. It's just uh, it's just excellent. It'll be virtual again this year. Mm -hmm. um, um, I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of studies. One we have in preparation, and one is under under review. Um, and basically, I'm going to be talking about uh, the application of joint control um, to the learning needs of children with autism and complex issues. Basically, how to teach tacting of yes and no, being able to say, yes, that's a pen. No, that's a cup. No, that, that that's a cup. Yes, that's a, a ball. No, uh, that's a table. That sort of thing. And also a, 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 um, um, a second uh, paper also that's, on, uh, that's in preparation on how you teach children uh, to speak loosely, remember things that are missing from a field, a very important sort of area, how you, how you speak introverbally. It'll probably be one of the first studies on the use of introverbal behavior uh, under the control of joint stimulus, uh, joint stimulus control. So it's basically a couple of joint control papers following up on a, a publication from a few years ago. I look forward to it. Awesome. Awesome. I'll have all the sign up details for the verbal behavior conference in the show notes for this episode. I've got a page full of notes. I'm on my second page of notes in this conversation alone, Vid. So <laughs> there'll be lots of stuff in the show notes for, for, for this episode. Uh, so um, uh, we're getting close to the end of our, our time here. Uh, I want to give you an opportunity to you know, obviously we had the passing of Jack Michael that you alluded to earlier. Uh, and really what I want to do, Vince, is just give you the opportunity to say whatever, whatever you want about, uh, his, his feel, you know, his, his influence on the field, his influence on you, uh, what, what you would like the audience to know about Jack Michael. Uh, and, um, yeah, so feel free to kind of share whatever thoughts you might have on, uh, on this, uh, important figure in our, in our, in our field of behavior analysis. Yeah, it, it it's so unfortunate that we we lost Jack on November twelfth in twenty twenty twenty. Um, Jack ha had an enormous impact on on the field, but mainly as a teacher. He didn't publish a lot, published some, but mainly as a teacher. Um, and and his teachings were amplified by his students over the years. So Jack's impact w was enormous in terms of just understanding basic principles, talking more precisely. Um, Understanding Skinner's analysis of verbal of verbal behavior, and of course his development of the concept of the motivating operation. What would we do every day in clinical practice with children with autism without Jack's teachings? I I don't know what that what that would be. I can tell you a quick anecdote anecdote about Jack. Please. In 19, yeah, in, in 1977, 
Um, Jack came to Drake University when we were all graduate students. That's five years before the 82 paper on the establishing operation. Scott Wood was a very good friend who was my mentor, who was a very good friend of Jack and one of his students uh, from Arizona. So Jack was hanging around quite a bit with us. And Scott basically um, taught us about what Jack thought and, and how he thought about it. So he came and he gave a presentation in 77 on the establishing operation. And he gave a colloquium of about an hour and a half. And we all listened intently to his, his talk. Now, this is the term had only been brought up by Keller and Schoenfeld and never really developed. So we listened intently. Following the, the, the colloquium, we went to Scott's house and we would always have cheese and wine after talks by Jack and, and others. And, and so we could interact with the, with the individuals. And we all told Jack how wonderful his talk was and how interesting it was and how useful it would be to us. Now, frankly, that was a bit disingenuous because on the side, each of us was saying, what was he talking about? And what has this screwdriver got to do with anything? Where does that come in? We all were just confused and had really very little knowledge of it. But of course, we were respectful to Jack and let and thanked him for his time. It wasn't for years that most of us ever began to realize what Jack was and the importance of what Jack was was talking about. He was way beyond all the rest of us in understanding those things. I had chances to interact with Jack because of Scott. And over the last 25 years have had more opportunities. We talk on the phone, we meet at conferences, emails back and forth. But the, the experience that strikes me the most in all those years was in 2007, Jack said to me that he'd like to come to our clinic in New York. I, I was surprised by that, but I was pleased. But I thought he was being polite, frankly, because he was such a polite and gentle man. But two months later, he called me and said, I haven't heard from you. I want to come to your clinic. I said, well, great. We set it up for him to come to New York. He told me the reason why he wanted to come is that he wanted to see, he hadn't been in clinical environments in, in a long time. He wanted to see how the analysis of verbal behavior and motivation was now being used in clinical practice. He knew what he'd written about it. He knew he read the literature on clinical practice, but he wanted to see it in action, he said. It was a delight for him to spend two days. And more importantly than what he taught us about behavior analysis is what he taught us about the field and our work with parents. He asked that we spend as much time as possible putting him in contact with the parents now, he watched every child very carefully, made comments, but he was very, he had meetings, several meetings with several parents and groups of parents, and he wanted to know how this disability affected their lives, what was different about their lives because of it, and were they learning behavioral principles in order to help uh, treat their children. He was more interested in the human side of what was going on than the technical side, although he was interested in that. But it's a side that you just wouldn't see unless you saw him in a clinical environment. It was not science for science for science sake, his writings. It was clearly to reduce human suffering uh, and help people, which is a side of Jack you just kind of couldn't see because the environment didn't occasion those, those behaviors. But once he was in that environment, um, I mean, he had lots of comments about feminism, a big supporter of feminism. He just was just a fabulous guy beyond being an incredible teacher. And I'll, I'll end by saying that on, on November 12th, I think we lost a dear friend, a colleague, and a teacher. But I think we also lost a thumb drive that, that contains some of the secrets of the universe. Mm. I, think, I think we've lost that as well. And um, we're so lucky to have had him for so many years to, to share what he had. But it is an enormous loss uh, for everyone. Uh, and um, we, we're sorry to, to see him go. But we, we have so much of a richer history uh, because of him. Well, uh, for that reason, I'm all the more appreciative of you sharing those stories. Um, yeah. Um, all right. Well, uh, it's, uh, I'm unsure how to follow that, but uh, I, I think what I'll do here is, um, I know you've 
just been, there's just so many gems from this conversation uh, and just lots of advice for both the newly minted and, and BCBAs of all ages. Uh, but if there are any final thoughts you have, Vince, uh, I'd, I'd love to just give you the opportunity to share them, whether it's advice for the newly minted BCBA, uh, as that's my kind of standard closing question, uh, as we've talked about, or, or anything else you'd like to, to share with the audience more generally. Yeah, just more generally, just to amplify the notion of think of the application of behavior analysis in a broader way to societal problems. These past few years had to have taught us the importance of changing our culture, our society. And this pandemic has only driven home the idea of science is the way to go. And we have the science that could pull us out of that. And that that's what Skinner really had. I think in mind. So number one, go in that direction. For the newly minted people, I would just say, suggest this. When you go to apply for a job, find a good mentor. Find somebody who works there who's going to be able to supervise and teach you. The earnings will come later, but find somebody to, to mentor you. I think that's essential when you think about a job, not just other some extraneous issues. Learn the science before you become a supervisor. And finally, other people have always said, you know, continue your, your, you know, your reading of the literature and so on. But l let me be a little bit more pointed. Read Skinner's writings. I think it is essential. Most people don't get a big dose of those anymore in, in um, uh, master's degree programs and maybe even in doctoral degree programs. Read science and human behavior. Read about behaviorism. Read the important works that that Skinner has has written. And of course, read verbal behavior, not just because it's an understanding of how to better treat children with autism, with language disorders. But as Scott Wood used to say, you'll never understand human nature until you understand Skinner's writings on verbal behavior and his uh, and his book. So I, I think you ought to read that book, not only from the perspective of treatment, but as a way of understanding what who we are and why we do what we do as a way of forging the field ahead um, in, in many diverse areas related to prejudice and, and, and equity issues, uh, you know, racial prejudice and other sorts of prejudice, all those issues. Skinner's book on verbal behavior tells you how our verbal behavior plays an important role in understanding and changing all of those areas. So read it from that perspective uh, as well. And by the way, the, the paper on why we haven't changed the world, I just recalled it. It's in, it's in the cumulative record. Okay. It's in, it's in BF Skinner's cumulative, uh, cumulative record. Um, but that would be my advice, uh, my advice going ahead. All and right. I, I wish I had the time to do it with you. <laughs> Yeah, this has been just such a, a fun and wide ranging conversation, Vince. Uh, I look forward to seeing your talk at the Verbal Behavior Conference. Um, and uh, thanks so much for joining me today. It was a pleasure, Matt. Uh, the work you've done to disseminate information from a, a diverse group of people is just excellent. And I'm really honored and, and pleased to, to be a part of this uh, part of your work. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast. <laughs>